Welcome back to Something in the Wilderness. This show is a song-by-song discussion of the Andrew McMahon catalog. Today, I'm happy to have a guest joining me. My guest told me that she used to be a casual Jack's Mannequin fan, so I thought it'd be pretty cool to introduce her to an Andrew McMahon in the Wilderness song. She let me choose the song, so this episode will be a bit different from the way we've done it in the past. I'm excited to see where this goes, though. So we'll dive into her past a little bit uh, with any of Andrew's music and find out her take on the newer stuff as well, hopefully. Welcome to the show, Nancy. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here and, and explore this a little bit more. Yeah, so glad to have you. Um, why don't you start by telling us a bit about yourself? At the moment, I am the host of my own podcast as well called the Flawed Workshop Podcast. And uh, we discuss creatives and the kind of struggles that creatives face in their endeavors to basically pursue their creative work as a career, uh, if that's what they want to do. So we discuss things like procrastination, imposter syndrome, uh, deciding whether or not to quit your job at some point. And um, we generally have a lot of fun. We're five episodes in. It's going really well. I used to be a musician. I'm, I'm kind of trying to get back into it. So I'm really excited about kind of relearning everything from the beginning. Mm -hmm. But I fell asleep with headphones in every single night throughout my teenage years. So it, it was and is still a huge part of my life. And I do remember just analyzing lyrics and mm -hmm. figuring out just I didn't really know much about music in terms of music theory. And so mm -hmm. I didn't have the vocabulary to express what the music did, but I was very animated with how I described how the music felt. Um, and that's what's important about music to me anyway. So yeah, that's kind of me in a nutshell. As I, I told you before we started recording, I just love talking about music with people. So it's one of my favorite things to do in the world. So I'm really glad to have you here uh, and we can we can talk about some music. Mm -hmm. You are by far the um, the guest that is furthest away from where I sit right now that I've had on the show. <laughs> can you talk a little bit about, about where you are? Yeah, I'm based in London at the moment. I've been all over. I was born in Latvia, Riga. Uh, my mom's from there. My dad's Tanzanian, and later on we moved mm -hmm. there. And I spent most of my childhood in Tanzania and then moved to the UK to uh, study at university. And I also studied mm -hmm. music and sound technology here. And uh, oh, okay. so I've, I've kind of lived in three countries and been very, very fortunate, although I don't really remember uh, much of me living in Latvia because I was five when we moved to Tanzania. So young. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now, I know your your online name is Nancy Art Music, uh, and you mentioned that you've been a musician in the past and you're maybe dabbling with, with that a little bit more again. Are you a visual artist as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I uh, I had a kind of break from playing music. There was a part of me that didn't realize that I needed to work quite hard, um, despite having a pretty decent singing voice, I think I can safely say. That wasn't going to carry me into uh, having a career in music. And that realization happened very slowly over a period of a couple of years. But I needed an outlet of some kind, and I really wanted to draw. And part of the way that I, I of course, still continue to listen to music I have a very colorful and vivid imagination and I really wanted to find a way to put that onto paper so that I could show it to people because I kind mm -hmm. of sound like a crazy person when I describe what's going on in my head. It's almost like when someone tells you their dream, I can see people check out halfway through after I get really excited. <laughs> yeah. But if I draw it, it's very concise. It's one drawing. It's like, look, this is what mm -hmm. I see. And I started to take a drawing, like an art class in... 2019 and got a little bit better and I used to draw casually when I was younger but I realized that I could express myself through drawing and that was really mm -hmm. fun and it didn't have the same pressure that I always applied to music in my own head about kind of performing it and making it perfect and it didn't have that sort of pressure to it and through that I developed yeah. um, a character called Umeboshi who is um, a tiny round little guy. Uh, umeboshi means pickled plum in Japanese. So uh -huh. he's just this like really tiny guy who's colored in with scribbles and he's got like a little 
face that's kind of in the shape of ski goggles. And he has adventures that are sort of based on my world. He really likes cake, just like I do. <laughs> and that's been really fun to kind of express myself through visual art rather than music in that way. And I think potentially could be part of the reason why I'm really, I think the creativity that I have with my visual art is now bursting further out into the world. And so now I need to mm -hmm. get back into music. Wow. Well, I've listened to the first four episodes of your podcast. I'm excited to listen to more. It, it's a world I don't know too much about, um, talking among artists and creatives and, and, the, and the challenges that come with that. So I'll be, I'll be curious to hear more. Ooh, I'm glad you like it so far. <laughs> yeah, it's the, um, the Flawed Workshop podcast, right? That's right. All right. So um, how did you first hear about Andrew McMahon and his music? Or was there, a, do you remember how you first came across it many years ago? Or, or was it just kind of a song on the radio? Uh, growing up in Tanzania, we didn't really have like a standardized, centralized place where people listen to music and get records. We had the radio and, you know, I think most of the stuff that was on the radio, it was mostly R&B, hip hop, gospel music. And then, of course, mm -hmm. uh, like local Tanzanian, East African, Nigerian music, that kind of thing. And there was never any dance music, never any rock, no real other genres. There was pop music from like the Billboard Top 100s, yeah, but not really much else. And okay. I, as an angsty teen, was very... I was trying to be rebellious. And I just at that point, I kind of aligned myself with rock music and uh specifically like the heavier like metal stuff two of my favorite like all-time bands from my teenage years are three days grace and uh in flames both of them also don't really sound anything alike but eventually like my angsty teen phase <laughs> sort of phased out as as it does for most people and i kind of got into this like romantic teenage brooding phase instead mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think so this is this has got to be where Andrew comes in I'm assuming oh yeah <laughs> I was looking for a lot of music and part of the way I found rock music generally was through pirating music because there mm -hmm. was no other choice even the CDs that I think most people purchased uh, were from street salesmen. And it kind of sounds almost like it's not really the image I have in my mind is like somebody opening up a trench coat with CDs like <laughs> on the inside of the lining. But that's not quite it. Mm -hmm. This is just a normal way that people bought music. Maybe so. In, so here in the States, in New York City, you know, when DVDs were, were a little bit more popular before streaming came around, people would sell DVDs on the street. Uh, would it be like that? Or That's exactly it. I think maybe this was more popular with cassettes back in the day when people used to kind mm. of try and get them off the radio and record stuff off the radio and then sell it on the street okay. that way. That is the main way that people purchased music in Tanzania. Um, or at least in my experience, I don't know where anybody else was getting their music from. But this was my, <laughs> my experience. But obviously through pirating, especially sometimes when you downloaded a file, like I would download like top 50 rock songs and it would be almost somebody's personal favorite playlist or something. Okay. That's how I found a lot of other bands like Linkin Park, Jack's Mannequin, The Script. And I think a lot of these things weren't labeled properly. So I didn't realize, or at least I, it didn't really register. Maybe this is also just a faded memory, but I thought that the script and Jack's mannequin overlapped in my brain. And they, mm -hmm. uh, because their music is kind of similar in ways if you don't really pay attention to it enough, which I, I don't think I did. I could see that. I mean, they're both a little bit pop, a little bit rock, both have piano. Mm -hmm. So I could see that. I think it was that piano that kind of mm -hmm. overlapped the two. And it was also the feel of the of the music. They both kind of hit that category for me. So when mm -hmm. my first boyfriend, he uh, when he had to basically, he was in the grade above me. So he graduated mm -hmm. and moved away. And I was really like brute, like sad about it. So I was listening to the script and I was listening to Jack's Mannequin and those kind of got me through uh, the breakup. I can't really even, um, yeah, Dark Blue. I remember like, I remember specifically crying to Dark Blue. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> because I was, Oh, I think a lot of people that's, that are listening can relate to that. <laughs> yeah, I am. Um, and I, I didn't realize what a big part of that time in my life it was until mm -hmm. I saw your podcast and I was like oh my god and listening through all the music and the entire discography was kind of like 
almost revisiting all my old memories and it's so nostalgic and I was it was like rediscovering my own memories through Jack's Mannequin it was so so wonderful that is so cool to hear and I I can relate to that because I've been a fan that's been listening ever since those songs came out and yeah it reminds me of those times of my life it it's like somehow his music has captured moments in my life. And I can say the same about some other artists as well. He's not the only one, obviously, but he's one of those that really stands up above a lot of them. Strangely enough, I think his new music also has that nostalgic feeling, and I don't really know how to explain it. It's it's weird. It, we spoke about a, I spoke about a song back in January called House in the Trees, and that one, it's like the moment I heard the opening notes, like it reminded me of my childhood. Mm. And I don't know, I don't know how, but I mean, some of it had to do with the lyrics, but, mm. but yeah, it's, it's very interesting. Just the, the sound of it, the lyrics, that stuff fascinates me. Music is such a wonderful transporter and time machine in some ways. It's really cool. It is. Yeah. All right. So the, the song that I picked today, it was, it was a hard decision because, um, honestly, if I felt a little bit of pressure, not from you, but just to, just on myself, it was like. Ooh, if I'm going to introduce someone to an artist that I love, you know, one of my favorite artists by far of all time, all I knew is that you knew the song Dark Blue by Jack's Mannequin. So that was the information I had to go on. And I liked <laughs> it like that. I liked, I liked just a little bit of information. So the song I chose today was High Dive from Andrew McMahon in the Wilderness. And I sent it to you and you listened to it. And we have not talked at all about it before now. So that's what we'll be doing shortly. And throughout the time we're talking today, I'll, I'll, I'll maybe give reasons why I picked this particular song and, and, and hopefully you enjoyed it. But we'll, we'll, we'll get to that in a little bit. So High Dive is track three on the self-titled Andrew Man in the Wilderness record. It was released on October 14th, 2014. And there's another version of it on the Canyons EP. That same version is also on the deluxe edition of the self-titled record. And High Dive was the second of four advanced release singles off of that album. Uh, It was released on September 2nd, 2014, so just about a month before the actual album came out. So, Nancy, had you heard this song before I sent it to you the other day? No, I. uh, but that's that's the sort of weird thing that um, I kind of mentioned earlier. It still sounded familiar in some ways, and I couldn't explain why. (laughs) Yeah, I think the, the first time I tried to listen to it, I wanted to get, give it my due diligence and basically listen to it properly. But I was doing something else and I skipped it. But also, rather than skipping it and like not playing music anymore, I played something else instead because I knew it, I think it was. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think my first impression wasn't overly positive. It's kind of grown on me over the last couple of days that I've been listening to it. It, hasn't, it wasn't okay. negative either uh, by any stretch. It was just kind of like, oh, it's a song. Yeah. And it's okay if it is. <laughs> if you didn't like the song, that's perfectly okay too. No, I mean, I I know all the lyrics now and I it's so good to like sing. I think one of the reasons they weren't uh, like Jack's Mannequin and Andrew McMahon's music wasn't a huge more permanent influence in in my sort of musical taste was because as a singer, at first listen to me, Andrew McMahon's d- voice doesn't sound as impressive as like an R and B singer who does all these like runs and goes well, well and like all that stuff. But I th- oh, yeah. don't think his music needs it, obviously, because it, uh-huh. it. But it's still warm and it's still full of feeling and emotion and that whole like you can't evoke these nostalgic warm feelings without sounding sincere about what you're singing Mm -hmm. but i think at the time and as somebody who likes to show off a little bit because his uh vocals weren't kind of like what i how i wanted to sing it kind of didn't remain in my life but with high dive the lyrics are very easy to remember and again they they seem like i would know them it's so good to sing and just like i get this visual image of like being in a car the wind is blowing you're like singing it and it's yeah it's just really nice something i appreciate i mean i've always appreciated lyrics and we'll by him and we'll talk about that for sure i appreciate i guess singers that you can understand easily you know when i'm listening to a song (laughs) i I wanna i wanna know what they're singing um because lyrics have been important to me Mm -hmm. and i guess that maybe that's why i tend toward pop rock more than like 
metal or you know really hard rock mm-hmm. or something you know i have to say it, yeah i definitely don't know the lyrics to some of my favorite songs from in flames because i i have to guess them and sometimes yeah. that's nice because i can just put in whatever i'm thinking that day like oh, i just wanted a sandwich and it's like that's obviously not what he's singing <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But um, yeah, I, I can completely understand. It's so much nicer to understand what the artist is saying. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, I think um, a singer songwriter type, you um, maybe tend to want to know more about the message that he's trying to get across. Whereas, you know, maybe maybe a metal artist, you know, it's not about the message; it's about the, you know, all about how it makes you feel, mm-hmm. how the mu- where the music's going. So I can understand that'd be very different. So look forward to hearing what you think about the song even more. So. Some production notes here. After Andrew wrote for about two months in Topanga Canyon on his own, he and Mike Viola collaborated together in Viola's Garage studio in Echo Park. And they came up with a demo of this song. They recorded the piano, some programmed drums, and guitar. And then someone had the idea to mute the guitar on the track. And they were surprised at how much it brought out the clarity of the piano. So they kind of went down that path for the remainder of the album from there. And Viola actually helped... Andrew Wright, six of the 10 songs that ended up on the album. It was recorded between several different studios between December 2013 to April 2014. And the album was produced by Viola, Andrew McMahon, and James Flanagan. But on High Dive specifically, Andrew performed the vocals and keyboards. Flanagan did the programming. Viola played bass. And a guy named Patrick Warren did the string arrangements on the track. Andrew McMahon in the Wilderness has been much more of a collaborative project with other writers and producers. So it's technically his solo outing, but Viola and Flanagan were the pretty consistent ones across this album. But did you notice a difference in style between what you heard on this track compared to the things you knew by Jack's Mannequin? I'd say there is a bit of a difference, but you could definitely tell that there was a commonality between these two Mm -hmm. different projects that piano sound is so key to everything yeah no pun intended and even in the first couple like the way high dive starts with those piano notes like ringing out really clearly above everything like it's kind of the main way that i remember dark blue it's that piano in the beginning Mm -hmm. it's very that's kind of what i remembered between the two songs that was kind of the thing that was like, oh, yeah, obviously this is by the same person. Same guy, right? Yeah. Yeah, and the the voice probably helps too, right? Yes. (laughs) Yes, it does. (laughs) Hasn't changed too much. It was almost kind of like ships in the night. We just kind of missed each other in in our key moments in life somehow uh, in terms of what came out musically and what was going on with me. But yeah, High Dive is wonderful. It just... It's so stuck in my head because it's so... Yeah, it's just really good. (laughs) According to Setlist FM, this song's been played live 363 times in concert, so it's up there with songs like Dark Blue, uh, definitely one of his more frequently played tracks. It first debuted, though, in July of 2014 in concert, which was a few months before the single or the album even came out, so he was playing it before people even knew it. And High Dive's also been featured in his most recent outings, on, I'll call it on tour. He's done some drive-in shows during the 2020 pandemic year, and he's also done several live stream concerts. I don't know. Have you have you heard about all the live stream stuff he's done? He's done a little bit more. I would say he's done more than the average. Yeah, through sort of binge watching a bunch of the music videos for everything, I've uh, I've seen that he. I'm quite kind of surprised because not many artists had that sort of dedication to live streaming and providing mm-hmm. their work to people essentially for free like that that was really nice and i really love his style in the sense that he starts almost every live stream with a cocktail (laughs) yeah that's definitely his style yeah and yeah speaking of style also i didn't after kind of watching going back to dark blue and uh some of the something corporate videos i didn't expect him to to say grow up sounds a little strange because i'm younger than him for sure but um but yeah grow up into like he performs in these are like really nice it's it's not like jeans and a t-shirt or whatever he's dressed like really well a really nice blazer like it's yeah unexpected from like a quote-unquote like grungy rock star (laughs) if that makes sense 
Yeah, it's been interesting to watch in real time the evolution of Andrew McMahon, his music mainly, obviously, but also um, just who he is, you know, the, the, the life experience he's had and how that's changed him, how that's molded himself, how it's molded his music. Uh, it's been really cool to see that. So um, going back to live streams for a moment, are there any artists that you are um, maybe more familiar with or a fan you consider yourself a fan of that have been just doing really good about putting out live streams and things like that? One that comes to mind is Dodie. Dodie Clark is mm -hmm. her full name, but she goes by Dodie. And she is an artist in, I think she's also based in London. And she's got an album coming out tomorrow, basically, uh, on the 7th oh, cool. of May, 2021. And she doesn't like when people call her a YouTuber, but she does put out a lot of content on YouTube and primarily grew her audience online through YouTube. She's very good at giving her audience a lot of sneak peeks and little previews. It feels in a time where if you have a very negative perspective that people seem a little greedy to not knowing that people haven't been able to actually tour their new album or do anything right. like that, that they're able to put out this content for free for people. Yeah, I yeah. Th the fact that he's able to do that and he does it so often, that's fantastic. Yeah, he was doing it for a while last spring. Uh, it definitely slowed down in the summer when he started doing those drive-in shows. And a couple other artists that I love that basically they've done such great live streams that I will, and, and these are paid for ones I'm talking about right now, but mm. uh, ones that I will keep paying for because they're such good quality and they've done so great. And again, kind of like you alluded to, like they're not making any money right now, like with albums mm -hmm. and, and touring their albums, which is how they make their money. Mm -hmm. So I just feel like, hey, if I if I can throw 20 bucks over here to, to see the, a, a live stream. So um, one band I'm really into that's been doing awesome with this is Anne Berlin. I'm not sure if you've ever heard Ooh, of them. Same, same phase of music. Yeah. yeah. Oh, my oh, I bet. God. I bet. Yeah. They're kind of like the... Um, I I bet both of those and and the other one I'm going to mention might might be familiar too Newfound Glory. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so all, like I immediately want to go and like listen to all of that because I'm like I'm convinced I have my when I was uh, at school like in that era I had a Nokia N8 um which is my little old smartphone from back in the day and it was mm -hmm. filled with just the most compressed mp3s of all this stuff <laughs> and i just like i still have it because it's it means so much to me it's got all this footage i used to film and take pictures of everything all the time but yeah it's got all that music on there and i just want to immediately run and listen to all of it <laughs> that's awesome anyway so i just wanted to uh, say that there's, you know, besides Andrew McMahon, there's some other artists I'm really into that are doing great in live streaming. And mm. I'll definitely check out Dodie, Dodie Clark, you said, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, D-O-D-D-I-E. Okay. I, lo I love to hear that artists are doing that. I mean, for as many terrible things there have been about the pandemic, I think one one good thing we've gotten, musicians are getting so creative in the things that they have to do to kind of get the attention of their fan keep the attention of their fans and I know that's what it's about mm. but some of them have have just been just doing such awesome things whether it's just a live show or or a video they're putting out or so I just I love those um the different types of content we've gotten and I hope that stuff even the ones that we that you know we've had to pay for I hope that somehow becomes available mm. uh whether to purchase or whatever down the road because I'd love to see some of that stuff again yeah but. and I think uh, it's really nice, actually, for the audience to kind of to, to be more aware of how artists make money and how musicians make money, because, mm -hmm. of course, I think a lot of people will see them as celebrities who have a lot of money already and so don't need to continue making it. They can just make music now. And that's often mm -hmm. not the case, even with big, big, well-known, well-established people. As much as I kind of want to pay for more and more live streams of all this this stuff when I can, ah, oh, it's just it. I can imagine it's probably difficult for the musicians themselves to try and strike a balance between yeah. what's paid, what's free, how much production value I put into this, how much time goes into preparing it and sending it out, and so I, I can't even imagine what trying to figure all that out is like. So kudos to them. Yeah, and, and also I know some of them are trying to put together tours or just, just here and there shows. So next month I'm going to see Andrew McMahon, hopefully, in Michigan, which is about four, four hours north of where I live. Mm. And um, he's doing these what they're calling pod shows. So only, you can only 
be with the people you came in with. Mm -hmm. I have a ticket to both nights and I'm hoping it happens. It's already been postponed once. It's also been, you know, rescheduled at a different venue at this point. So we're just kind of getting nervous. Us fans are getting nervous. Like, is this thing going to happen or what? Yeah. Can I assume that the concert industry is basically on pause over there as well as it is here? Yeah, I think I haven't seen many of the live shows that got canceled last year come back up. Mm -hmm. But actually, I've got a ticket to see Dodie in August this year in mm -hmm. Brighton. And it's a very small, intimate gig, apparently. She's very into doing like personal meet and greets and stuff like that when she can. That's going to be interesting to see what that's like. But um... yeah, so I got some some songwriting notes about uh, about Andrew writing the song. And I found this article on BuzzFeed where he he told them this. And I'm going to quote. When I found out I was ill nearly 10 years ago now, my wife, then girlfriend, and I had just begun the process of reconciling after being separated. We married in the midst of my recovery and left the beach towns where we grew up to hide out in Los Angeles. Moving back to the beach in 2011 began the process of closing the loop on that chapter in my life, and it forced me to revisit loose ends. In High Dive, I found myself asking the question, if this wild disruption had never taken place, what would that reconciliation have looked like? Would I be the guy driving by our house late at night, hoping to catch a glimpse of her, but knowing I couldn't come in? In its most universal sense, it's about loving someone so much that you'll take anything they're willing to give, even if it's not enough. And I'll link that article in the show notes. Any thoughts on that? Yeah. In my preparation for this episode, I think I, I read something similar, but maybe not in the BuzzFeed article. And I was mm -hmm. quite surprised because I didn't I guess I misunderstood the lyrics if that's what he meant with them. But very similarly in some ways, because I thought the song was to himself in some ways. Mm -hmm. So where he talks about like headlights in the driveway, I kind of imagined somebody like him from the future pulling up to his own place in the past and oh, watching him listen to somebody else's song that being not somebody like another musician or like somebody else, but he doesn't recognize the person in the past that he's looking at. And that person is somebody else who's listening. It's it's very, it gets very meta. But basically, the young version of him is listening to something he's just written. And future Andrew McMahon pulling up and watching this through the window is like, man, wow. Like, what is that like? I don't remember. And it, it, to kind of reemphasize that feeling of nostalgia, it was kind of like yeah. I got the sense that he was revisiting his own past. And um, uh -huh. I wondered if he was trying to maybe get something back from then that he doesn't have now. So that that's kind of how I, I misunderstood the lyrics because I didn't think that it had anything to do with a, um, a relationship um, with like a significant other. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> Just a, a brief bit of background. He uh, started dating his now wife, Kelly, during the something corporate days in the early 2000s, maybe 99, mm -hmm. somewhere in there. And they were together for several years, and then they broke up. And then the first Jack's Mannequin album is pretty much all about that 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 separation, that breakup and separation. And then they got back together a couple of years later. Um, he was diagnosed with cancer, went through treatment. And then they got back together through that process and then got married shortly after that. So from what I've read and the way I've interpreted it, it's like, what if they, you know, based on this this quote and some other things I've read, what if they didn't get back together? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, what would his life be like now? But I, I do really like that theory you have. That's such a cool, you know, movies that portray those type of concepts are ones I really get into. Those like, you know, mind bending, mm -hmm. you know, he's looking at himself and then his past self is listening to his future music and saying, who is this? What is this? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I love that plot. That's that's a, so I'm pretty fascinated by what you just said. Yeah, I mean, in my head, it was I think maybe the reason I interpreted it that way was because that's what I'm going through at the minute. Because <laughs> mm -hmm. I uh, kind of revi revisiting your past. Yeah, because I yeah. wrote and performed and sang like I basically did. I made an album when I was about 14 years old and uh, I was very proud of it for a very, very long time, but obviously I hadn't really recorded anything since. And this whole dilemma that I had like three, four years ago where I was like, am I a musician if I haven't made any music, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. I got embarrassed at some point that 
I called this my proudest accomplishment and I removed it from all the platforms that I had it on when it was online. And I lost the actual files and I lost the CDs, like the physical CDs of it. And I was really desperate to find it. So I, I, speaking of my little old smartphone, I like looked through there, I connected it, the battery is completely gone. So I had to like plug it in at a really awkward angle because so is the port. I was really desperate to find it. And I did a few weeks ago and I was... You found it? I did. I was... Oh, I'm so glad to hear that. I I was like out of my mind ecstatic to finally have it back. And it was really weird. Like that's, I think, why I... That someone else's song, that someone else's song lyric hit so hard because I was listening to my own music from back in the day that Mm -hmm. I couldn't really i would never write some of the things that i wrote because they're 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 really adorable i know that at the time i thought i was really talented and i was like this is the pinnacle of music making i'm amazing (laughs) but um i had a lot to learn i still do and i didn't know that at the time so that person to me is completely separate and i'm i'm much more Mm -hmm. humble now i hope and um it was that sort of disconnect where the lyrics were like someone else's song was like, oh my God, he's totally talking about himself, obviously. Because <laughs> um, I think I on one of the podcast episodes for Something in the Wilderness, your podcast, this podcast, um, you mentioned that he there are some songs that he doesn't necessarily perform anymore because they he wrote them when he was younger, um, mm-hmm. which totally makes sense. I'll actually... Um be looking forward to the potential day now that I've heard your story to uh, maybe you'll release those tracks online again because I now I'm really curious to hear them. I'm planning to. I have a whole musical project in the works to redo them and kind of keep them as faithful as I can to the original ones without kind of messing with them too much but elevating them a little bit and also some new things. Ooh, that I'm nervous about. So yeah, we'll see. That's so cool. Well, I'll keep following your podcast and 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 listen for when those are available. Ooh, thank you. Yeah. Have you ever heard of the sliding doors concept? Uh, no, but it sounds a little bit kind of like alternate timelines and the butterfly effect and all that sort of thing. Yeah, I think it's pretty similar to the butterfly effect actually, because uh, the sliding doors effect is you know you're going down to the subway train and you're rushing to get there and you didn't get in and the rest of your day goes on and it leads you down, you know, the rest of your life. You did make it on the train and it could completely change the entire trajectory of your life mm-hmm. with that one little decision. And that's the impression I have about, you know, what high dive is about. So when he says, you know, what if we never reconciled? What if the reconciliation was different? What would it be like? Would I be standing outside your window watching you? Basically, it was somebody else. The headlights in the driveway mm-hmm. are somebody else's. They're not mine. And I'm, I'm, I'm here just pining for you. And I have an example in my own life. I mean, we could probably think of a million examples. But in my own life, so um, I've mentioned the show before that I moved to the state of Maryland for a teaching job uh, years ago. And um, the reason I did that, though, is um, I went to a job fair in Michigan where I was living at the time. And there were tables representing school districts from all over the entire United States, Colorado, Arizona, Virginia, Georgia, Florida, Maryland, Michigan. And I went to the Maryland table, the the county that was hiring in Maryland, because the line was shorter. So it's like, well, I don't know if I want to go as far as Colorado, Arizona, or Florida, maybe I'll check out Georgia. Mm -hmm. I'll check out Virginia. I'll check out Maryland. But the Maryland line's shortest, so I'm going to go in the Maryland line. And I got in line and I interviewed and that led to me, you know, long story short, I ended up accepting a position in Maryland Mm. and which arguably changed the whole trajectory of my life because I now live in Ohio because that's where my wife is from Uh because I met my wife while I was teaching there uh, in Maryland, whom I never would have met. Had I not gone to that table, that is so because the line cool. was short. I love stuff like this so so much. <laughs> I think about this concept pretty often. Like, wow, if I had just made one different move, it would have changed. Who knows what? Can you think of any times in your life that you could use as an example as a sliding doors concept? Uh, one that immediately springs to mind is how I ended up in the UK. I went to a boarding school in the north of Tanzania. 
uh, at the time it was called uh, ISM, International School of Moshi. And I graduated from there and I wasn't prepared to come home yet. And I convinced my parents to let me stay with a few of my friends, which was a huge ask. I technically really had no direction because I hadn't decided what university I was going to go to. Because of all of my friends being international and also going to university and college all over the world, literally, mm -hmm. I kind of realized that we would be separated. So that kind of got me into a slump. I got a little sad and I really wanted to live life to the fullest. So I stayed with mm -hmm. my friends as long as I could. And Moshi is a very small town and Dar es Salaam is the place where everybody, that's the main city. It's not the capital city, but my friend said, let's do the drive. It's like six, seven hours. We're going to basically fall asleep that night and then wake up really early in the morning and get home to Moshi. Mm -hmm. My friend said to me, if you do not make it to the car at 8 a.m., I will leave you. And I was like, sure you will. And um, <laughs> I didn't make it to the car. <laughs> Uh, I came home very late. I overslept, but I was also hungover, and my parents saw me drunk for the first time ever, so that was really uncomfortable. And they were like, mm -hmm. yeah, you're not going anywhere, young lady. Basically, I it was very clear that I was unhappy with being at home, and my dad handed me a ticket. He was like, here you go. And I'm like, oh, I'm going to Birmingham in the UK. And he was like, you're staying with my friends. Don't come back until you find a university. And I was like, yeah, okay, cool, great, I'll go. And I, it was no argument. But had I done what I thought was best for me at the time and got to that car, <laughs> I don't know where I would be. Yeah. But it might not be here. And at the University of Portsmouth, where I went to study, I met my fiancé, Alex. Uh, he's the co-host of the Flawed Workshop podcast with me, and he's wonderful. And yeah. That's incredible. Yeah, it's it's totally that that sliding doors thing. It's like if you um if you made it or if you didn't completely. Uh, sometimes I overthink it. With Andrew, it's like big pivotal moments in his life that I know of. It's like what if he had never gotten sick with cancer? That you know mm. that's obviously something that we don't have any control over. He doesn't have any control over. But what if that had never happened? His, his life trajectory might have changed. What if he had never broken up something corporate and Jack's mannequin? wasn't a thing what if he had never gone off and, and done his own thing with jack's mannequin mm -hmm. you know we, we'd probably have something very different from him in terms of music and the ultimate you know with the song is what if he had never married his wife and she was with somebody and he was with maybe somebody else and maybe he'd be thinking those what ifs you know what if what if kelly and i had been together so mm -hmm. it's it's an interesting concept i think it's easiest to for us as humans in human relationships i should say to think about that one you know it's like okay all these things had to line up mm -hmm. in order to, to get to that point. It's really fascinating to me. Yeah. Let's talk about the sound and the instrumentation of the song. I think you can definitely tell that you're getting something a little bit different than a piano rock song from the opening beats. There's that programmed drum loop, and but the piano is most obvious. Did you notice something missing from the music when you listened to it? Or did everything sound pretty much like, a, okay, this is what I expect of Andrew McMahon? I think that it some guitars were missing as... M I expected more guitar, I would say. I noticed that when he, the song is being performed live, the first time I really notice it is in the second verse after the uh, after the chorus where you get that dun, 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 dun. and mm -hmm. that's the first time I properly notice it. And I, um, yeah, I found that a little bit surprising. Yeah, because um, something corporate was so guitar based and Jack's mannequin was guitar and piano. So I, I, I just thought that was really fascinating. They decided to, to take out the guitar on the track mm. uh, and then take that approach for the rest of the album. So how does this music make you feel when you when you listen to the, the music itself, uh, maybe lyrics aside? I think it, it's very hopeful. The way the song unfolds, it's, it's almost like a story where there's like a, even the first chorus is, it's there and it kind of sets up the next chorus and the rest of the song because of course the instrumentation sort of builds along with it yeah for sure and it as it does that by the end it's this like amazing culmination of everything that was in the song up until that point and it's just really wonderful uh, so let, let's talk a little about lyrics then um so one of the things i appreciate so much about andrew's music that i mentioned earlier was was his lyrics and you know, I like singing along to them. Some of them I can really relate to. But I just love this idea. So he's written a lot of songs about his life. 
and he's written some songs that are just about fictional characters and things. But I feel like this is kind of in the middle, if I'm if I'm understanding his lyrics correctly, in that it's kind of fictional, but it's also based on his own life. Are there any lyrics that particularly stand out to you? Hmm. I think it would uh, mostly for me. It was just the that I misunderstood them in such a completely like run with it way that <laughs> that it was kind of funny. No, and, and I think. I think what you said about the lyrics could be true to an extent. Mm. Like he's looking back. I mean, he's definitely looking back in the past and, you know, at, at somebody. But he, you know, maybe he is in a way, maybe it is kind of a metaphor for himself as well. I don't know. Yeah, I think some a, a bit of confirmation bias in the song for me was flashbacks get me close. I'm almost there. The flashbacks implied to me that he was remembering. Uh-huh. And that was kind of what spurred me on to think that like yeah he's talking about himself he's looking at himself Mm -hmm. one really uh, i don't know if this kind of makes sense but uh there's something about some of the songs that also remind me of owl city a little bit and um i could i could definitely see that yeah i'm I'm a big fan of owl city as well mm -hmm. and and mostly again fireflies is the song that everybody knows of them it's also a big meme uh, recently (laughs) The, the one million fires burning. I mean, I, th- I feel like he was describing stars, but it could also be a metaphor for each of these little universes where all this other stuff was happening, all these paths that he could have taken. So each oh, yeah. little fire, each little star represents an entire world where he's existing, doing something completely different. And I thought that was pretty cool. I like that interpretation a lot. Yeah, I, I would have to agree with you on the flashbacks get me close. I'm almost there. That line is just so particularly powerful to me when when he said when he sings that. We all have this nostalgia, you know, human humans in general, we all have this nostalgia for the past and looking back and it's just it's so powerful when he, you know, flashbacks get me close. I'm almost there and the way he sings I'm almost there. It's like he wants to be there. Like mm-hmm. I can almost get there. Uh, with these flashbacks, but I'm not quite there, and I just want to be there, just even if just for a moment. Mm-hmm. That's kind of what what that line's saying to me. And it has so many different implications because that one line alone doesn't really elaborate on why he might want to be there. Because mm-hmm. you could want to be there to experience that for a second to realize then that your own life where you are now is the greener side of the grass in some ways. Yeah. Or just out of curiosity to see what it's like. So yeah, it's really, oh, it's, a, it's such a good line. Yeah. My other favorite uh, lines of the song come in the first verse uh, where he says, I wrote a new song about your new life, like steps I retrace. And so I, I made this note here. Do we think he would still be writing songs about Kelly? Assuming the song's about Kelly, would he still be writing songs about her mm. if they weren't together anymore? Mm. You know, if he had gone down there, you know, if he's sing- a single guy out, you know, living a life and, or, or you know, he's with somebody else. Would he still be writing songs about this mm. lost love? Yeah. So to kind of wrap up the song discussion, is there a favorite part of the song that you have? I know we've talked about lyrics, but lyrics or melody or, or anything within the song that's like just kind of jumps out at you like, oh, that that really that part of the song really stuck with me. That little bit of actually, I don't think it's a guitar. I think it's a synth uh, in the second verse that goes din, 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 din. Mm hmm. It's very playful in some ways, and I think actually it uh, it follows it maybe follows the lyric "teenagers in the alley kissing," uh, which mm-hmm. kind of makes sense because it's like all oh, kids, <laughs> yeah. like that's the okay. The kind now of... I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, all right. So that's the kind of impression I I, I really like that because it, it's not necessarily obviously it fits in quite beautifully into the song, but mm-hmm. it. It's kind of, especially in live performances, it sticks out. It doesn't, uh, I think, in the studio recording of it, but I noticed it when uh, I watched one of the live performances of it. Also, and I don't know how to describe it without listening to it, I watched him perform it in a session where it was just him and a piano. I can't remember where it, where this was recorded. Uh, he was wearing like a red long sleeve shirt. Maybe the Shabby Road session. That's it. Yeah. I'm going to link that one in the show notes. It's it's beautiful. And I think because yes. it's just that, just his voice in the piano, uh, you mm-hmm. can kind of hear the notes kind of go up and down as he's singing it. I don't really know how to describe it. His vocals kind of go up. So the melody kind of goes up, but the piano goes down. Okay. It reinforces that whole, this could be 
good, but it could also have been bad. Like that kind of mm -hmm. duality of what he's saying in the song. And I think that's pretty cool as well. I like your interpretation how, you know, it's it's trying to put that feeling into the music. Like like you said, my favorite part of the song is um, that chorus. You know, it's so he he tends to have some have some pretty anthemic choruses. Um, and that's what I would say this song had in common with Dark Blue. Mm -hmm. That kind of striking emotional piano is one thing. The uh, anthemic chorus is another. But that chorus is my favorite part, especially when he says dancing to someone else's song. Because that line really strikes a chord with me, and I can feel that. It's like, wow, if the love of my life had gotten away and she was out there with somebody else, I can understand what that might feel like mm -hmm. through those lyrics. Is, the, is that crazy to say? I, no, I don't know. No, it makes complete sense. I mean, mm -hmm. this, is, this is what I love about music and lyrics and, and yeah. overanalyzing them. It's so much fun to imagine all these all the ways that the song means different things to different people. Did you have a chance to watch the music video? Yes. I found it very strange after having... <laughs> yeah. After um, yeah. kind of being like, oh, this is so personal and it's so meaningful to him, clearly. And then it's it's very disconnected from all the things I imagined, even the accurate, the more accurate meaning of the song that he intended. I just want to give a little background. So the, the video was filmed in Elysian Park, which is just on the border of the Echo Park neighborhood of Los Angeles, California. And and then just to summarize for those that haven't watched the video, Andrew's singing to the camera in Elysian Park, uh, while separately we see adults walking or running around either by themselves or, or with somebody else. And eventually somebody looks up at the sky and they notice what looks to be two suns in the sky. There's also a horse that appears to one one woman walking around the park. They yeah. all, all the people in the park end up coming to what's called Angel's Point uh, at the Glass Simons Memorial Structure. Uh, and as the day goes on, Andrew makes his way to a woman's house and he's standing outside her house at uh, while there's headlights in the driveway and he's literally watching her through the window uh, and she's looking back at him. And then he makes his way back to the park at Angel's Point where all the people are standing. And then what looks to be a meteor comes down and, and destroys the city, Angel's Point where they're standing, and presumably the world. Mm. There's some obvious imagery here. Is there anything that you took away from, even if it wasn't something that I said, anything that you saw in that video? It was mostly that the part of the video that kind of brought me back to the mm -hmm. song was the part that was quite on the nose, where he's in the car and, and she's in the window. And I was like, yeah, cool. All right, we're back. But the rest of it seemed very... Almost like the, it could have been for some other song in its entirety. Because yes. I didn't get that sort of vibe from the song that world was ending in some ways. Or maybe, I guess, oh, maybe it was that if the only way to get to this other universe is for the world to end and start anew so that it can kind of go back Futurama style. I don't know if you've seen that show i haven't but i've seen that portrayed in other movies so and as you started to say that i started to think about along the same lines i think we're on the same track there mm. absolutely maybe in order for to return to uh kind of start over and go to the new timeline or the alternate timeline mm -hmm. i have to blow that this world has to blow up first yeah. this has to end but I, so, it, interesting. it kind of makes me wonder though because i'm assuming that he enjoys his life now because, you know, he's... Right, but he he was writing it from the perspective of, you know, he wasn't with Kelly. Mm. And what would it be? So it was like that perspective of the guy in the alternate timeline mm. from where we are now, the alternate reality. So, okay, I don't have this, this amazing girl that I was in love with 15 years ago or 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. I, I want to get her back, but I, I screwed up back then. Yeah. I guess that makes a lot of sense, a lot more sense, because he's very calm in the whole video. Mm -hmm. Everybody's noticing all these this like second son and they're kind of curious and they stop what they're doing mm -hmm. and i think maybe that's maybe what it is he's kind of summoned this meteor somehow from <laughs> from space to come and start the world anew maybe it's the universe he's created mm. what i found interesting is the literal imagery headlights in the driveway mm -hmm. you stand in your window you stand with your headphones on uh when he, you know he walked up to the woman at angel's point to hug her and then Oh, teenagers in the alley kissing. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, you know, a couple, when, when that line plays, there's a couple making out. 
So it's just, it, it was, in, so may, maybe it's the world he's created. Mm-hmm. So I guess that's the only other explanation I could think of it. On first watch, I was kind of just like, huh, this is not what I was expecting. Yeah. I, I really am quite a fan of very literal music videos. For songs where the songwriter wants to remain a little bit ambiguous about the meaning so that the listeners can decide what they want to take out of it i think literal Mm -hmm. music videos where they just display what the lyrics are saying can help basically keep that a little bit more mysterious because you're only showing people what it is what it is that they're listening to and then yeah um, maybe the director or the uh, if the music video is animated which i'm i would love to do one day it's kind of what i'm hoping my drawing skills eventually lead to but if that the director or the artist is interpreting the song lyrics literally but through a style a lens of like a different style that can help things a little bit and maybe they can put in little Mm -hmm. easter eggs in the background as to what the real meaning of the song is yeah that can be quite fun but i think because on first watch this was so so different straight away i was kind of taken aback a little bit and it took me a while (laughs) well it took me until us talking about it to kind of maybe decipher it. <laughs> yeah, I'm coming away from this conversation with definitely more than I came in with um, about that video. And I'm, I'm definitely starting to think about it in a different way. Mm. There was also a tour edition of the music video, but that was just clips of Andrew playing in concert with the, with his band. And there wasn't a whole lot to that, but it did make me miss concerts more. Mm. Oh, <laughs> it always does. There was a live performance of him playing it with somebody who was playing the accordion. And I was like, that is awesome. Really? I missed that one. Love to see that. The accordion didn't feature in it as much as I was hoping, but that's because uh-huh. I think because of my, uh, like I was expecting it to, re- accordions are loud. So I was really mm-hmm. expecting it to dominate the the musical space a little bit, but it didn't. It was just kind of a very nice accompaniment. <laughs> You'll have to send me that link. I'd like to see mm. that one. Speaking of other versions, did you listen to the Canyons version, which was the, um, but it's it's very similar to the Shabby Road version ah. uh, session that you talked about earlier. Yes. So basically it's the same idea. Mm. So it's just Andrew at a piano. And what I love about the Canyons version, which is it's available on, on streaming networks because he released it as a four song EP. Mm. So he gave the same treatment to three other songs off of that album. Sometimes I prefer those versions of those four songs more to the originals, including High Dive. Mm. I love it so much because it's just him and a piano. I get this visual when I listen to that version of him sitting in a dark house, maybe with no lights on and just candles around Mm -hmm. him. And he's just playing and it's so intimate that I I don't think the original version can quite capture with everything going on in it. Mm -hmm. But with just Andrew and a piano, it gives you a different feeling. Yeah, It comes across a little bit more sincere even though the the studio recording Mm -hmm. is sincere on its own the studio version builds to like a very you know someone else's song like like it's like this big oh no and then when you listen to the the sort of canyons version of it it's just kind of it's almost like acceptance versus panic in some ways Mm -hmm. because in with him and just the piano it's almost like he's just calmly considering this and being like hmm this could have happened but it didn't and that's you know i guess that it is what it is whereas on the studio version it's like oh my god i need to do something about this it's like this is happening and it's without me And, and yeah i can see how the two songs i'm glad they both exist Certainly. There's also a remix out there by an artist named Grey Goon. And I listened to that probably for the first time all the way through this past week. I'd never gotten past the first chorus, I don't think. Mm-hmm. I just don't like it. I It made me uncomfortable. I'm frankly. with you with that. Yeah. It takes the word song and samples it and basically pitches it down. I'm assuming because mm-hmm. I, I haven't like dug into it too much, but from what I know about music production and sampling and stuff, it sounds like they sampled like him singing song the word song and pitched mm-hmm. it down. But Oh, okay. But what it reminded me of is have you seen Spider Man into the Spider Verse? I have not, no. There's this um droning sound that they use to kind of represent the villain when they one of the villains when they they come on screen and it's this mm-hmm. like it's like really 
intense. It's not necessarily unpleasant because people still have to watch this movie. It's maybe maybe jarring, maybe just to kind of, oh. Yeah, it's like, oh, something dangerous is about to happen. Yeah. And because of that vibe, I kind of associated that with the sample of the word song in the remix. And I was like, oh, that's not how I want to feel this song. It sounds fine. It's not for me. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm not a purist of original versions all the time, but I do find that remixes of pop songs, I don't typically enjoy as much as the original. Uh, some I enjoy, and I found some great remixes of songs that I wouldn't have expected out there, but this was not one of them. It just took away from the original like the original was almost unrecognizable at times mm -hmm. i don't want that for this song it, it took away the emotional weight of the song yeah which i didn't appreciate that i don't think i'll ever listen to that version again no i'm with you with that yeah it, it's also that i couldn't really sing along to it maybe that was part of it for me i could see that because that's kind of how i am with music because mm. i mean you were saying earlier about you enjoying the clarity of lyrics mm -hmm. even for me where that's not always how I enjoy music I found it difficult to for lack of a better term like vibe with it because I was like I don't know how to enjoy this <laughs> that's where I was too mm. but, well the last version I just want to make mention of is the Instagram live version we've already touched on that a little bit but those live streams he did last year so on April 11th 2020 he performed this song just on his piano and his out in his garage where he where he did all those live streams from. It, so, I'll, But I will say, all, as much as I loved those live streams, if you listen to the Shabby Road session or the Canyons version, you're going to get a better studio quality mm -hmm. version of something very similar, uh, just the intimacy of him and the piano. So I appreciate all those versions. Nancy, do you have any final thoughts on the song that we talked about today? No, I think I'm very glad that you brought it to my attention because it's so great. <laughs> There's so many things about it that I like, and I don't think I would have found them otherwise. I'm I'm so glad to hear that. You know, it's 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 always a risk when you introduce anybody to new music. I appreciate that you were so receptive to to the idea. More receptive than some of my own friends, actually. You know, it's like, hey, check out this Andrew McMahon video. They're like, oh, not Andrew McMahon again. You know, but <laughs> so so thank you for um for offering that opportunity to me. Mm. So based on the Jack's Mannequin material, you're familiar enough with, or even the stuff you've listened to um, since we started communicating, how does this song rank for you in in out of the songs that you know? Uh, would you say it's like a higher tier, lower tier, like right in the middle? Like, where would you put this? If I was to kind of arrange it, it's not so much that it ranks differently. It's I would listen to it on a different day than I would maybe something corporate stuff. Mm -hmm. But I can definitely see it fitting in on a, the same playlist as uh, Dark Blue, uh, and just being very perfect for it. Yeah. I don't want to come across insincere because I'm so excited about something I heard of yeah. for the first time like only a week ago. But mm -hmm. uh, I see it kind of belonging to a, a playlist that I'll listen to when I'm feeling nostalgic or when I want to uh, revisit a, a part of my own life as I do in my head with putting my own memories into songs and interpreting them as differently as life moves on. I'm glad to hear that. Last question about about the music. I'm I'm curious. Will this lead you to listen to more Andrew McMahon or Jack's Mannequin material, or do you think it'll be about the same from here on out uh, where you go with this? I think it'll probably be a little bit more. I really enjoyed uh, High Dive in particular, and kind of revisiting a bunch of songs that I remember listening to, but I just didn't realize that they were his. I can't even remember what the song was, but just today when I was going through some videos on YouTube, I saw a, a video started playing, but I wasn't really quite ready. I think I it was actually maybe the last thing I watched before starting this call, but I was like, oh my God, that's his as well. So mm -hmm. I, there's a lot of things that I'm going to that I'm excited to rediscover. Yeah. And you mentioned uh, Amberlynn and Newfound Glory. Whoa, I cannot wait to <laughs> to go back and listen to more of that because I think I'll just be reliving an entire part of my sort of adolescence and a point where I thought I was grown up and ready to conquer the world. <laughs> 
Well, thank you guys all for listening to the show and getting to know Nancy Art Music a little bit. If you like what you hear, please rate the show on Apple Podcasts, wherever else you can. Also, I do love listener feedback on Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook, so find me at Something in the Wilderness. And if you want to share your thoughts on a particular song with me on the show and following Nancy's footsteps, I can even pick a song for you if you like, like I did with Nancy. Email me at somethinginthewilderness at gmail.com and we'll get something set up. Big thank you, of course, to Nancy Art Music for coming on the show and discussing this song with me. Nancy, I really enjoyed our talk. I love talking to other music fans in general, but obviously specifically about Andrew McMahon. It's, it's such a cool little practice to kind of throw out a song that you, you hadn't heard before and dive into it, you know, no pun intended. But. Yeah, it was my pleasure. It was it was lots of fun and so many aha moments. And even just discussing the video and unpacking it together yeah. on this uh, call has been really interesting, fun, and so great. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, uh, where can we find you online? I am nancy.art.music on Instagram. I am also Nancy Art Music on TikTok and Twitter and I have a YouTube but I have not uploaded enough for YouTube to give me a custom URL but you can find me at Nancy Art Music there as well. Okay and don't forget to check out the Flawed Workshop podcast either on anywhere you get your podcasts. Mm -hmm. Again thank you Nancy and for the rest of you I'll see you out on the high dive. Thanks. Bye.